Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's Writer's Chat. And this is where we all like to gather together as writers and talk about all things writing for writers and by writers. So we're so glad to see everybody here today. It's snowy in Northwest Ohio and I see yeah. And so I'm glad to gather with a community of friends today. Warm my heart, warm my heart on, on that way. So we're so glad to see everybody here today. And we just said before we started recording, that we invited everybody to kind of stay on today when normally we kind of take everybody off, talk about something and bring something back. But we're gonna have an open mic today that Norma is gonna lead us. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Norma here in a minute and have her introduce our topic. And we hope you participate. So if you come in on a little bit, or if you're in the chat and if you wanna come on, just hit, hit your camera and come on or put something in the chat if you wanna share. On, on that way. So I thank everybody for being here today. Thank you if you're taking the time to watch the replay. We know a great deal of you do watch the replay. So we're, we're always, you're, all, you're as much part of our community as those that are here live. So we're happy to have everybody here. So Norma, I'm going to turn it over to Norma. Why don't you tell us what are we talking about today that you wanted us all to stay on camera? Well, today I thought it would be interesting to talk about um, childhood memories, because they shape us and who we are as adults, and they also impact our writing. And originally, I thought um, about doing, uh, talking about childhood memories in response to helping you set a scene. Some, a lot of times in fiction, we have trouble sometimes setting our scene, or maybe even trouble with a character. And by going back to uh, favorite childhood memory, or if it's a, um, a bad scene, maybe going back to something that was troubling in in your past, and allow those emotions to come up to help you bring that out in your character, to help you bring that, whether it's an ominous feeling or a delightful feeling, to help bring that out in your writing. And this applies to nonfiction as well. When we do mm -hmm. devotionals, when we um, do uh, nonfiction writing of, of any kind, um, spiritual especially, we draw from our experience and how God has led us through, brought us through things. And so, and, and some of that's even as a child, I'm sure all of us can look back in our to our childhood and see maybe though we weren't believers yet in Christ but we could still see God's hand on our lives would, would y'all agree with that right and so I thought it would be fun today to talk a little bit about some of those fun memories um, that we've had from either childhood or teen years maybe something that that's really either shaped us or would just Maybe this might help us add some oomph to what we're writing. Again, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, a while back, uh, we have a, well, let me back up for a second. Writer's Chat has a Writer's Chat fiction group, and we go through books. And so a while back, we were doing a, a book, and Johnny was leading that episode. And the exercise was to write out a favorite memory. And then after, you know, we all shared it and then talked about maybe how we could turn that into a scene. So we're going to do that today. While we're talking about some of these other things, I want you to be thinking about a favorite childhood memory. And um, if you're willing to share just a little bit, then I'd love to hear what your memory is. And maybe we can brainstorm a little bit of how we can turn that into a story. And one of the other things they, uh, that we talked about in this book was maybe even uh, map setting. Uh, draw out a map of your childhood home, several blogs or the mm -hmm. town or whatever. So just to kind of get used to, because I know in several of the books I've read, they talk about, especially for fiction, but also it would work for nonfiction, um, Making a map, I'm looking at my table as if there's a map in front of me and there's nothing but my empty hands, <laughs> but making a map so that when you're talking about in your stories where you're coming from, where you're going to, then it, it'll make sense and you're not just randomly throwing words out there. 
So that's, that's kind of where we're going today. And um, <clears throat> you'll excuse my little bit of a froggy throat. I'm nervous and um, I get kind of crunchy when I get nervous. <laughs> but anyway, so let's um, start with um, the, I'm trying to remember the name of the book. I just had it on the tip of my tongue and now I can't remember. Um, I'll try to get that back to you. I know it'll come back. Um, but anyway, the guy's name was Bill Rohrbeck, was the author. And I think it was Writing Life Stories or yeah. something along those lines yeah. Yeah. by Bill Rohr, R-O-O-R-B-A-C-K, Bill Rohrbeck. That's it. And in that book, he has this exercise that I'm talking about. Um, so if somebody could put that in the chat for me, that would be great. I'll hold, yeah, I'll hold up the... Where's these authors? Name? So you can see. Well, got to get it right. Nope. There you go. Nope, over a little bit uh, the other way. There, there we go. <laughs> so it's it's really interesting and has a lot of great ideas in it. It is applied. The book it talks mostly about fiction, but like I said, we really could apply it to our nonfiction writing. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my favorite childhood memories was well, I grew up in the 60s and we would, and especially in the summertime, we would play outside until when the street lights came on. Yeah. I'm sure many of us are familiar with when the street lights came on, you got to go home. But we would play um, sometimes even after that. And one of my favorite things that, that I like that we did was we would play block tag. And basically block tag is hide and seek on the whole block. And you couldn't go in any enclosed, like a shed or in anybody's house, but you had to hide. You know, you got behind a tree to hide or whatever. And there would be, I don't know, 10 or 12 of us playing this game. And it was just a lot of fun. And of course, in the 60s, all the neighbors knew each other and we knew which houses not to, to go on their yard. There were a few of those. But mostly we could come and go as we wanted to, and um, we had a great time. So I thought about how would that play and make a scene for a story? Ideas? Mm. Any ideas? What do you think? I'm just thinking that the, the sounds of that, the laughter, the giggles, the uh, how the air might feel that would, that would make me think the census more than if I was just trying to write that scene without remembering it or living it first. You could hear the kids giggling and yelling all mm -hmm. out of hand free or something like that, you know. Yeah. And the term we use that I found out a lot of people don't know, and maybe it was just a Florida thing, but when we were finished and there was maybe a few people we couldn't find, we'd yell, Ollie, Ollie, Oxen free. <laughs> and I've said that to a couple of my daughters in law, and they're like, never heard of that. And so, but that was, that was our thing to make everybody come out from hiding was Ollie, Ollie, Oxen free. Where it came from, I have no idea. Rhonda? I can tell you, we did the same thing. And, and everybody's like, I don't know. I don't know what that means, but but I did some research on it because you know me. I'm a research geek. It was uh, early on. The phrase was "all ye, all ye, all come free." Okay, at the end of the game. Okay. And somehow, because we are all just, um, you know, how how things, you know, that you play that whisper game where it goes around and how it changes. Right. You know, but somehow through through the years, it got distilled. But it was exactly what you said is what we said when we were kids, and we all thought it was you know mystery words. But right. really, it was, <laughs> it was just uh, it was just a, a distillation of an old phrase that got got you know converted. But uh, I was thinking of your setting. What a great! I'm thinking of a, a YA or a, a middle grade book where where two kids go in the yard where they're not supposed to go and they find out why they've not supposed to go there they come across something really mysterious or ominous you know and you it starts out with this 
you know, happy go lucky, let's run around the neighborhood, but it ends up in some place that, that is really foreboding and mysterious. And so I could, I could see that being a really fun setting to start off, a, you know, like a Hardy Boys or a Sugar Creek Gang, you know, some of you are old, as, old enough as me, you can remember Sugar Creek Gang, right? Yeah. Uh, kind of mystery. I, I like thought of, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jean. No, I was gonna say, I like what Kathy said. She, she like murder, she's a murder mystery writer. I could think of the hide and seek as a protagonist getting stalked, liked for and playing in the kid's game. Yeah, that was, that, but I think Ali Ali and Free could be the magic word that might open a fourth, fifth dimension <laughs> and they sneak into the back. Anyway. Uh, and I, along the lines of Kathy, I thought is, um, what if one of the kids doesn't come out from hiding and something has happened? whether he went, he or she went into the yard that wasn't supposed to, or they were taken or something like that. Mm. Um, or they discovered a skeleton or something and it freaked them out and they fainted or who knows, I, you know, all kind of things have kind of run through my mind as to what that could be. And um, living in South Florida, the roads are like a grid, north runs, you know, you have north and south, east and west, and everything's in numerical order. Um, avenues one one way and streets one the other, and it's super easy to plot out. Nothing like Hickory, North Carolina. Yeah. Oh, my, I, I think um, the person that mapped out this area was probably inebriated in some way. Because the one road that runs about five miles has four different names and you have a 34th street crosses a 34th street <laughs> like no joke so i would much rather map out south florida thank you very much <laughs> no, no, no. sci-fi writer here i would say like i used to play that same game we used to do the same thing at dusk and i would climb into a big old tree and i just lie on one of the big branches just lie flat as i could but the sci-fi writer in me says, what if the tree absorbs them? <laughs> so go all spooky. I love it. Yeah. Or, or like in Lord of the Rings starts walking away with them or boosts them higher into another dimension. That's good too. I love it. There you go. Yvonne, yeah. you were going to say something? Yes. And, and this is based on truth. This actually happened to me. It just so happened that one of the nights we were outside playing, it was Halloween. Oh. And Ooh. I'd never crossed into anybody's yard, but peer pressure, mm -hmm. let's go into so-and-so's yard, such a crabby man. So we did go mm -hmm. and we overturned his two trash cans and he heard us and he came out chasing us. I can remember my heart pounding so fast. I, I said, oh my word, it's going to burst right out of my chest. I'm so scared. Yes. Did you see what Isabel wrote too? Can you, Yvonne though, that produces the feelings inside us, which is kind of what we're saying. And then I thought Isabel's thing about you even look at some of the classics like Little Women and Laura Ingalls and uh, the Bronte Sisters and Anna Green Abels and Tom Sawyer. Those are all based on childhood memories, aren't they? That, that is a great point, Isabel. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And, and I thought it would be fun, especially here at the beginning of the year. Maybe some of us have new writing projects or maybe we're a little bit stuck and need some help. And maybe the stories that we share today won't necessarily help you, but maybe the feelings that come from these stories, the sense of being scared, the sense of complete joy and excitement or hearing the laughter in your, in your mind again of, of something really fun. So um, with that, is there someone else who would like to share for a minute, a favorite childhood memory. Well, I'll start because she kind of primed a couple of us ahead of time. So that'll give you guys a time a little bit more to think. But just a point that 
I, I wanted to uh, add to this. I found I'm not one to remember a lot of things from childhood. I'm really not. And so I, when you proposed that question to us, I thought I got to really do, do my homework. But what I found out last night is the more I thought of one, it led to another, to led to another, to led to another. And it almost became an avalanche of things I had totally, totally forgotten. So uh, if you're like me and not a big one on memory, allow yourself to indulge in this. So Norma, I just really appreciated this topic because I did not think I could remember all those details until I kind of opened the door and it just opened it all the way on that. And then the other thing is that I'm in a part of a mastermind group right now. And one of our assignments was to identify our pillar stories, the main stories and I, things that have shaped us. And I think that's something we could think about, not just to create the moods and, and find ideas, but some of these childhood stories are pillar stories. They're how God originally touched us, maybe. How uh, it could be even a traumatic or it could be a blessing experience. So I will tell mine shortly, one of my pillar stories, and this will date me because I grew up in the 50s and I was about five years old when polio was a pandemic. Think about that word. And parents were frightened to allow their kids out in summer in any kind of water because it just was hit and miss that somebody was fine one day and by the evening they were sick and on iron lungs. And it was a horrible, scary time for polio, a pandemic that most of us don't even remember, I don't think. But anyway, my dad was a physician. So not only did he have a little girl to take care of, he had the medical background also. So he, he watched over me pretty carefully. And the very, very first polio vaccine he got into his office, he brought home for work for me. And the pillar story is what I remember is I, I can barely remember it. I was probably four or five or six, right through then, probably five. And I was sitting on the floor in the living room playing with some blocks and um, or playing with something. I don't even, it couldn't have been blocks. It was something. And my dad came in and sat, and this is what I remember. It was a wing-backed straight chair. He sat down, there was a table next to him. And he said, Jeanne, come here. I have a gift for you. And I walked across the room and I honestly, guys, do not remember getting that shot at all. But I know he gave me that shot in the arm and I don't remember, but what I remember was the love and the tone of his voice. And it was just, it was a pivotal moment. I did not have that memory till probably 15, 20 years ago when God brought it to my mind on a retreat. And I kept thinking about that. I was like crying, thinking about that. Boy, what a lovely moment that was thinking how much my dad loved. I have a gift for you. Oh, all, all, the tone of his voice, I could still hear it. And God said, Gina and I have a gift for you. And it's the gift of life. And wow. so it was just that same unconditional, that moment of unconditional love from childhood repeated as an unconditional love all through my life. And I didn't recognize that probably one of the first times I was really comfortable recognizing God as father. So anyway, that's a pillar story. Mm -hmm. See, it's based on a childhood memory that, uh, continues to the day, you can tell it continues today to form me. So, and, and that kind of, I tell, talk a lot about unconditional love of God. So anyway, that's my little story to share. I don't that's know a, if, uh, who all else you assigned and who else might have something. That is a powerful story, Jean. Mm -hmm. And just, I think all of us could just feel our hearts were, first of all, drawn into the story, yeah. but the emotion that that stirs up is mm -hmm. again whether we're writing devotion or fic or nonfiction or fiction that we still need to know how to express that emotion and sometimes it takes stirring that emotion up to be able to to express it and kathy yes. made the comment in the chat about it's hard for some people have a time remembering the past and i really do kathy i i don't all remember all those details but it was it was phenomenal last night. The more I remembered one, and I think looking at albums, pictures, 
to a high school, for example, or something like that may stir stuff up too. But it was amazing how when I started thinking about one, I started thinking of another and another, and it did kind of come, but it take, you have to be intentional. Think about it. I think especially the older you get, we have to be more intentional. Because <laughs> there's a lot more years to go back. I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, or uh, Kathy. Catherine said about journals. Yeah, I'm a journal keeper. Catherine, that's a very good point about journaling. Mm -hmm. That way. I don't know if Brandy or Melissa, I know you guys had a heads up on this question. If either of you had something to share. Um, well, like you, I have trouble um, drawing back to memories and, and mine's kind of more along the lines of I've always been the, you know, the people pleaser and the person who's more trying to engage in personal conversations with others. So I spend more time trying to hear other people's stories and getting to really talk about mm -hmm. myself. So you kind of start to forget your own memories when you're listening to everybody else and not, not really putting in. So it was kind of hard to, to draw back and really think of a specific memory. Instead, I would like you kind of draw on several memories and they kind of would all come together. And I was thinking for myself, um, my happiest memories are oftentimes um, exploring the, the woods around our home with my sister. We had our adventures going out in the woods. And um, when we were younger, we, we lived up, I, I think I mentioned this in previous uh, writer's chat, we lived on a place called Breakneck Road and it was way up in the, the, the hills and near the Black Hills and the, just surrounded by pine trees. It felt like a world apart on its own. And then when we moved from there, it kind of felt like we were robbed of our secret um, hiding places, our, our, our world that we had invested in. So when we got to our new place, my sister and I had resolved that we were gonna go out and explore the woods around our new home and try to find a new fort, a tree that was our place. And we, um, we spent several days going out hunting around through the the woods, finding treasures and checking out trees to see if they were worthy to climb and build a, a place around. And, and we found the perfect pine tree that had big sturdy limbs and we could climb up into it and it became our fortress. And uh, we would carry treasures back there and, and try to find ways to haul them up into the tree. And eventually our dad kind of got involved and he built a little hut down at the base of the tree and put a pole into it so we could slide. And he even built us a little zip line so that we could, uh, climb the tree and zip line out of it. And that was one of our, our fun memories. We always love to go and hide in our fort and hang out there. How and fun. you write about fortresses and trackers in, in mm -hmm. Scotland or Ireland. And you and Rhonda uh, messed up on these two countries. Now, think about that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yep. Fortresses, Rhonda, you must have loved the fortresses, didn't you? I did. Um, I was, I was the only girl and I had two brothers and we were very competitive. And we played mostly with each other because we moved around a lot when I was, was young. And I, I, was, I was thinking, you know, my brother, I have uh, one brother in heaven and one brother still living. And whenever I bring up a memory, I like to talk about our childhood. He's like, that never happened. You're imagining that, you know, and, and it's his favorite thing that didn't happen. You know, and it always surprises me, but you know, my memories are mine. This is something that I, you know, because people will try to influence your memories or stimulate memories. And sometimes that's not the way you remember it. And I have just learned to be kind of assertive about my reality. And maybe you don't remember, but this is what I remember. And this is what it made me feel. I'm getting ready um, really soon here to write another chicken soup story. I've had five of them published and I'm submitting another one later this week. Um, but uh, they're, they're asking, their call out is about cats. And most of my memories as a child were about our animals. I can name every pet. I can tell you uh, every, they're all their colors, their eye, you know, what their habits were, you know, and things that I did with my pets. I just love my pets. And so I have a lot of cat stories because we had several cats, but one I, I remember, and you, you were telling us, Norma just set the scene, it was Christmas. And we were visiting my grandmother uh, out in rural Ohio. And we went to the church because my mother was a pianist, a very talented pianist. She wanted to practice on their piano. So while we were there practicing, these two little stray kittens came up 
and just loved on us. And don't you know, as a child, I just ate that up. They just loved and loved and loved on us. And that was fine on Saturday, but the next day was Sunday. And while we were in church, I spied those kitties when we were walking into church. Well, when everybody was in and we were in there having worship service, those two kittens started yowling outside the door. And it was so pitiful. I started crying. I was just crying because I felt so sorry for the kitty cats. And so my dad, and very uncharacteristic of him, he handed me the car keys and he just gave me an elbow and said, go get them. So I took those kittens into our station wagon and climbed in the back where we had some blankets and things and played with the kittens during in church. And I felt like, you know, a, a prisoner that had escaped the jail, you know, at that point and got to skip the sermon and go play with the kitties. And it turns out uh, we adopted one of those and he was my kitty. He lived more than 20 years. It was, he lived to 22, which is real old for a cat. And um, I'm thinking about that story and just, you know, all of the stories that we write, they need a takeaway, you know, and, and, and what, is, what is the takeaway, you know, the, the joy that an animal can bring and how we are, um, you know, I, I personally believe we were put on this earth to take care of the animals. And so when I have this really tender heart toward animals, I mean, I can't watch Marley and me or any of those, you know, kind of things. I just can't watch them. But that then I'm fulfilling one of my God-given purposes when when I care for for the animals. That is that is precious. I love it. Somebody else, Sophia, you had your hand raised. Yeah, uh, of course. When I unmute, um, of course. Uh, mine is actually also um, polio related, and I ended up using it in a um, in a workshop on memoir and poetry. Um, and I think I'll read the poet, poet poem real quick first, and then I'll lay the whole background out. Um, it's called "She Couldn't." I needed to jump rope this need unknown before I left for school, but on my return, she asked about my day. I can't jump rope was all I had. She taught me. One step at a time, swing the rope over my head, hop as it skimmed the floor, never let the rope fall still. She taught me. Mother, who couldn't hop with two feet, having only one, taught me to jump rope because she couldn't not. She taught me. And the background of that story is that my mom had polio. She was in China. She was three years old. There was flooding. And after that, she never walked um, with a strong leg again. And years and adventures and stories later, she actually had it amputated because, I mean, it's an incredible, she wrote it down. So she's got this incredible story. she did all the things she was told she couldn't do. She came to America. She got an education. She got married. She had children. All those she was told she could not do because she was a cripple. <laughs> um, and I remember when I was five, I needed to jump rope. And I was really down about it. And she, she had a prosthesis by then because she was an amputee. And she step by step taught me to do something she couldn't do. And that is one of my foundational memories. <laughs> what an image that is. And you could all draw all sorts of uh, takeaways like Rhonda reminded us from that. Wow. And the poem, <laughs> wow. That just added a dimension. Wow, that is powerful. That I'd like to powerful. add something about memories. Um, they say that some of the strongest memories come from smells and sounds and not Mm -hmm. just pictures. A lot of time we tend to think about pictures in our memories. And some of the strongest memories I have are connected to smells and sounds. Every time I open a bag of rice, I'm instantly brought back to kindergarten because, and oh, and, and a certain brand of soap, I don't even remember which soap it is, Uh, but dish soap because in kindergarten, it was my introduction to a bunch of brand new people. They gave me this sense of wonder 
And every time I smell rice or I smell soap, I think of the little playstations that we used to get to play in where we were playing the little sink with the soap and then there'd be rice things. And so that really triggers those types of memories for me. Kindergarten, very, very earliest memories where I don't have clear pictures, but I have the smells. And another one that really has stuck with me over the years is the sound of my grandfather's slippers sliding on the wood floor as he would struggle to walk with his Parkinson's. And he would just shuffle, 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 shuffle. And there's a certain sound, it's like a sandpaper sound. And every now and again, I'll hear it. And it instantly will take me back to watching my grandfather struggling to lift his feet off the floor and trying to get from one part of the house to the other. And you know, th those, those are the types of memories that are like, they're like really, really strong. I mean, I have a whole host of other memories. I can remember when my dad um, would tell me there was this one time I didn't have a lot, you know, any brothers or sisters when I was really young up until nine when my, my brother was born. Well, I had a couple, but they didn't live with us and I didn't know about them. But um, when I was younger, my dad was like, okay, every now and again, you know, getting to, to be with him was uh, special. And I had my bike, my brand new bike. And he's like, okay, well, I want you to start on this hill. And it's this, just a little tiny mound of our, our lawn. And it, kind of humped down and then it went out onto the pavement where our driveway was. He's like, okay, I want you to start at the top of the little mound and I want you to go down, hit the pavement, go as fast as you can and see how far you can go. Cause he was like, oh, it's competition and trying to urge me on and we're having fun. And so I'm like, okay, so I get on my bike, my brand new bike and I get, and I start going as fast as I can. I go down the mound and I hit the concrete and I flip over the handlebars onto the concrete and both my palms, my elbows, and both my knees were completely skinned and bleeding all over the place. And now I'm in pain and everything. I still, you know, they say you, they say you don't remember pain. You, and maybe you don't remember the actual, but I remember the intense burning. It just burning, burning, burning. So it's, it's, it's almost like a ghost feeling that I can sense and feel. And that's connected with that. And I was so caught up in, ow, oh, all the pain. I don't know what my dad's face looked like. And I don't know his reaction because I was in the middle of my own. But thinking about it now, I can only imagine that he must have been mortified <laughs> because he was trying to encourage me and go as fast as I can. And then he caused me to get hurt. So <laughs> thinking about that now as a parent, what a story that could make, you know, the other side of what happened, you know? So those are just some of my thoughts on, on memories. <laughs> wow. I know sometimes as parents, we encourage our kids to do things. And when, it, you know, we have in our head how that's supposed to play out. And when it doesn't, man, the guilt, we feel like the worst parent, like on the yeah, planet Earth all, in yeah. all of time. Yes, yes. And then Randy said something about seeing it from another's point of view. Can you imagine any of these childhood memories? We flip the POV, you know, and, and seeing it that way. That would really, it's kind of reminds me a little bit of some of the fairy tales where they tell it from the Big Bad Wolf's story or the Wicked Witch's story, you know, that you, know, you, you see it different like that. Can you imagine some of our memories? That, 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 the, the man that you knocked over the garbage cans, you know, I mean, what is his story? You know, I think it's fascinating. I know Tina's got a story for us. I saw that in the chat a while back, so I don't want to miss her. Tina, you want to unmute and share? Well, my first memory was when I was about three or four years old and I was being such a brat. I was the poster child for the strong-willed child. I had my parents were painting the inside of our house and they were really busy. And I think my, my younger brother might've been born. I wasn't, I'm not sure if he was another issue that caused them to be distracted, but I went out in the backyard where there was a dog that they'd found that was a stray and it was tied up. And I got too close to the dog that was jumping at its leash and barking. And I thought the dog's tooth went in my eye. I don't think it actually did because I wasn't bleeding, but I was certain the dog's tooth went in my eye. I went in the house. I was howling. I was so upset. I was looking for attention. My dad said, go talk to your mother. My mother was painting. She said, 
let's see your eye. There's no blood in your eye. You're fine. The dog did not touch your eye. I was furious that no one would pay me the attention that I was sure that I deserved that day. No one cared about me. So I went and got my little black and white checkered suitcase and I stuffed it full of the things that I thought were important. You know, a couple of things of clothes and my teddy bear and I zipped it up and I went storming across town. Now, this is not a big town. This was a town that didn't have a stoplight. If it did, it had one didn't even have a high school. You had to drive out of town for high school. So I was going to go tell my babysitter goodbye because I knew that my grandmother would care about me. My grandmother would pay attention to me. And after all, it only took us an hour and a half to get to grandma's house. So I could certainly walk there. And I was going to go tell my, my babysitter goodbye. So I went storming across town with my little suitcase in my fat little hand to my babysitter's house and went and knocked on the door. And as soon as I got to my babysitter's doorstep, I turned and I felt like someone was behind me and my parents were there. They had been driving very slowly right behind me in the station wagon all the way across town. <laughs> and they had arrived at my babysitter's house with me and got me and scooped me up back in the car. And, and this story reminds me that sometimes we misunderstand our circumstances and think that God doesn't care about us. And sometimes we think he isn't even there with us as we're so upset trying to find other ways to get our needs met, but our father is right behind us all the time and he's always with us. Mm. Oh, I love that story, I, even though I was being such a brat. That, that is super. Norma, yeah. what do you think about that one? Uh, that was a great one. And I love the parallel to how when life is hard or maybe God's not answering our prayers how we, we want him to, I feel like he's not there, but what a great comparison and a reminder that God is always there, even when we're being stubborn and want our way. And he's saying, oh, no, my dear, my dear child, no, you don't love me. You know, and we stomp off. Um, he's still there. And he never leaves. He, he just, follows oh, right back. Yeah. And it shows the power of stories. We were all kind of pulled into that, weren't we? Yep. Uh, that, that is a great story, Tina, on that. I think Rachel's got some stories for us. Mm -hmm. There's something there, too, she wanted to share. What you got, Rachel? There you got it. What does normal want me to start? <laughs> we got gotcha. you. I, mean, I have a bunch. I remember things from when I was a year and a half which people find hard to believe, and my oldest daughter does too. Yes, I remember the little poodle in Ireland. I remember the big iron sink that my mom used to stick me in to give me a bath and that the chairs had a rail so I couldn't catch the poodle when it ran onto the chairs. <laughs> Frustration. And the door opened to the snowbank, like right felt like you opened it to a wall, like when you looked at it, because it was right there. Um, but some favorite memories. Um, climbing into grandma and grandpa's bed on Sunday mornings and grandpa would flick on the old wooden radio on his, on his, on his nightstand and it would turn on to Billy Graham coming to you live from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we'd listen to Billy Graham <laughs> and they'd sing, they'd start with singing How Great Thou Art. And we listened to Billy Graham preach before he we went to church in the little white stone church. And um, when we got home from the little stone church, Every Sunday, one of my favorite members of grand memories of Grandpa, they raised me till I was nine, um, was sitting with him in, in his sun dappled chair on the veranda every Sunday after church. And we sang once in Royal David City and all things bright and beautiful out of his hymnal. And I have a picture of that. It's one of my precious, precious memories. And um, so I don't know. I have um, you guys brought up dogs and, and secret places. Um, well, um, if I can share this, um, just starting in the middle of nowhere in this piece um, and running in the sunshine and romping with the dogs, the adventures of climbing over rocks covered with periwinkle flowers and the crimson carpet of Oda'iti apple blossoms on the ground and the secret places in the garden, the place between the hibiscus hedge and the June roses where they bowed over. I would pick them and mix them with Queen Anne's lace to make a bouquet. I put them in my hair too. Then I would march down the garden aisle and pretend to be marrying my prince and the bougainvillea bushes that greeted you by the driveway, how they danced and waved such happy, happy flowers. Um, so 
So, um, and then my grandparents, we were out in the country. So our evening ritual, one of our evening rituals was to, um, that I wrote a little thing for was, um, as a little girl in the hush of the blue black velvet night, I'd look up and wander at the star studded skies and talk to God. I'd ask him questions and marvel at the majesty of creation. I desired to know him, but I didn't know how yet. And my grandparents almost every evening would sit under the stars in the garden, just in the dark with lawn chairs, and they would just talk quietly. And I would just listen and think about God and look at the stars. So those are some of my, um, some of my favorite. And then let someone else talk. I have a piece I wrote on my dad that Norma likes, but. Um, in fact, I believe it won an award, did it not? Um, no, that one I haven't entered anywhere yet. Well, you um, pardon? I said, well, you should. I should. <laughs> <laughs> Daddy holding my hand as we entered the botanical gardens, Wrigley's gum, elephant air pastries, matchbox cars, him carrying me when I was hurt and scraping every speck of pepper off my food, and bumper cars. I hated them, but I never told him because I liked to hear him laugh and we were together. Aww. Of that one. You are a poet. That's for yes, sure. That's for sure. You know, Isabel, the, very, <laughs> the very first thing I wrote was a poem. And the very first thing I won an award of with was a poem. Mm -hmm. And in boarding school, when I was being bullied, I just remembered this the other day. I did the craziest thing. I wrote a poem telling them how I felt. And they all were crying and no one bullied me again, except for one girl that still bullied me out of the six. And uh, well, I took care of her with my Oxford school shoe. And well, she never bothered me after that either. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great memory. I love it. And again, talking about children's story or a YA with bullying being a big issue these days. That's awesome. Isabel, did I say you have your hand up that you had something you wanted to share? While you were all talking, I just wrote this and this and this of awesome. memories. So <laughs> I'm not sure you have time for all of these. Uh, I'll just say to make it quick and short, uh, those that give the most emotions inside like uh, putting my hands in my grandfather. He was living 800 kilometers from ours. Uh, so we really, we saw him very, very few. In the 60s, you had no motorways. The first, I remember the first motorway. So walking and having my hand in him, it was just like being lavished in unconditional love. But I was, uh, the last one I wrote as we were processing is one linked to writing. It's when I was 10 years old and we were giving assignment, you know, you have to write things uh, like creative writing for children. And so we had the, the, the French teacher said, okay, this is the text. It's a bunch of children, they're visiting a museum and they forgot to go out. So they got locked inside. So now write what happens. And so she expected us to rewrite about um, or no, reusing the vocabulary about uh, the, I don't know, painting and sculptures and, you know, like they would wander until someone would pick them up. And so the 30 or 25 pupils, they all wrote that. But myself, I was always uh, reading the Annie Blyton, um, the club, you know, the, the club of the five, I don't know how you have it in English. Uh, all these, no, um, uh, Alice, uh, was it Alice Queen? Um, the, the Alice series, I'm sure you, Caroline Queen, the Alice series, you know, they were making, um, yeah, like crime inquiries for children. And so that was in my mind. So what I wrote is that those kids, when they were locked, they went underground and they discovered a secret room where there were a lot of thief and they were American smugglers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> stealing the treasures and stealing the painting and smuggling them through the underground tunnel and so I wrote that I was just like wow I've got a story 
and she publicly shamed me in front of everyone that I was completely out of the subject because I should have been doing the end of what would be a normal story for everyday children that would not meet smugglers and thieves with guns and whatever. And so I, I really took in the public shame, but in my head, I was, no, like I'm a genius and the others, they, they have no creative brain. That's right. <laughs> Well, I don't say anymore, but you, you guess the point. Yeah. <laughs> and why I'm here today. I love it. I yes. love it. And I love your confidence in that. You know, that sometimes that can be defeating. Yeah. yeah. On that. You know, that which reminds me sometimes when as adults, when we rethink process, even some um well, I'm just, I'll go back to like the Brandy story about falling off the bike stuff. You know, it is amazing. Um, we can have some real deep healing by reliving some of these and writing these out and getting a perspective like from your dad, Brandy, you know, from, from that, you know, I don't know. Yep. Yep. On that. Well, this has been, anybody else want to share before we, Brandy, go ahead. Um, I was just thinking about um, how, oh goodness, it totally just flew out my brain. <laughs> I guess I'm not thinking about that anymore. <laughs> I did, I, oh, okay. I remember what it was. Um, well, it just listening reminded me of when I was in kindergarten. Now I'm a vocalist. And so I used to sing everything. I would sing commercials, I'd sing anything. And, and way before I even went to school, I was just always singing. And I didn't realize other people couldn't sing until I went to kindergarten and we're in music class and I'm listening to people around me, other children singing. And I feel bad thinking, you know, looking back on this now, but I remember being in, in music class and just like, covering my ears because other people couldn't sing and they were so badly off key it hurt my ears and I I was like I was traumatized because I had never been around anybody that couldn't sing before so it, it was I mean that was like my first introduction to something that was outside my world so I mean you think about that when there were a lot of people outside our worlds you know um in our stories when we write them we're always thinking, we're always writing them from our own worldview. Well, gosh, that was an, an incident where I was suddenly slammed up against somebody else's worldview, but it was totally didn't meet mine. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that made me think of, um, you know, something made me think of that. Um, other stories that people have told me to think of that. Sorry, I'm stumbling. But um I also thought about when, Rachel, you were talking about your earliest childhood memory. One of my very earliest memories is me playing on my favorite stuffed animal and it was a giant elephant. I don't know about any of you, but I, sometimes I wonder how early back do we remember and do we actually remember back farther than we realize? And I'm, I'm wondering this because I later found out that that elephant was literally only like this big. And my memory is that it was a mountain of an elephant that I had to struggle to climb up on to get on top of this elephant and sit on this stuffed elephant. So I must have been in like the one to two age range. But, you know, I, I sit there and I think like that maybe our minds have a capacity to remember more than we think than it does and that there are triggers all around us if we will be attentive to them and listen to them. And even in listening to other people share their stories, it triggered my own memories of my own stories. And uh, one thing I know from personal experience is that if I come to the table thinking I can't do something, I automatically can't do it. It just shuts everything down. But if I come with an open mind and think, well, let's see what God has for me today. Let's see what God will open up. And 
allow God to bring out things from those stores that are way deep inside, he will. I think he will. He's done it. Yep. Um, Norma reminded us about our childhood homes. You know, we lived in several different houses. And again, I'll go back. I don't have memories. And I challenged myself one day. We, we were in a long car trip coming home and I just had my eyes closed. I thought, okay, I'm going to walk through this house. Where was the bed? What did the bedrooms look like? Where were they? We had two staircases in this one house. And actually I did that again last night when I was thinking about the thing. And that brought me back to that place, just almost physically imagining walking through the house. And I had not remembered the one back staircase came out on the landing. And I had not remembered that till last night. It didn't come all the it didn't go all the way up to the second floor. It came out on the landing and then we had a probably six steps more and it was just I was there you know and so it'd be it would be a neat and the other thing I was hearing from everybody is the important setting think of all the elements of setting we had with this I was just phenomenal Norma I'll let you kind of well do what with, you want to do you got a minutes. couple minutes um with Valentine being just around the corner um I wanted to end with this story it's one of my favorite I grew up in foster care back in the 60s. My mom was schizophrenic and spent time in and out of the state hospital. They didn't know much about mental health back then and they put him in a state hospital. If you ever saw one flew over the cuckoo's nest, that yeah. pretty much is reality for back then. And so when I was seven, um, I went to live with my adoptive family. And that first year on Valentine's Day, my dad brought, bought my mom this huge, I'm sure you all have seen it, the really big heart-shaped box of chocolates. Yeah. So he brought my mom that and flowers. And I can just remember sitting there going, aww. And then I was getting ready to turn and walk away and go to my bed, my bedroom. And my middle name is Ruth, and my parents called me Ruthie. So my dad was like, Ruthie, come here. And I walked over to him and he pulls me close. I'm going to cry, y'all. And he gives me a little miniature heart-shaped box that just had the four little chocolates in it. Oh. And I was the only girl. They had, I had three brothers in that family. So um, he gave that to me. And every year until the year I moved out, I always got a little box of heart-shaped chocolates to remind me that I was his little girl and that uh, it was just really sweet and thinking about that I can envision the living room I can even smell what my house smelled like and so that's one of my many precious memories from growing up and my dad was a very strong he was like of the John Wayne era kind of guy so he I was 52 years old before he ever said I love you but his gestures like that on Valentine's Day always made me feel special. So when you're wow. stuck or you just, you need to step away from what you're writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, take a trip down memory lane. And Leslie had talked about that her parents died when she was young. And mm -hmm. she's today has helped her to push past that a little bit. I remember the good things before that. And, and I think there's healing in that. If we can push through and remember the good and not let the tragic or the traumatic control us. Because that's where the enemy wants us to be, mm -hmm. is stuck. But God has called us to write. And these memories and these feelings and emotions are what's going to spur us on when we feel stuck. And mm -hmm. that's I just thought it would be really fun to share this today, and I hope you all were encouraged. Hope maybe you got some story ideas or character ideas or setting ideas. Um, that was, Isabel did, yes, she did. <laughs> and so it has been a delight to hear all of your stories, and I'm just reminding what a big, awesome, loving father we have in God Almighty. Thank you. Well, thank you, Norma. Thank you for, first of all, she came up with the idea for those of you that don't know when we get together and do some brainstorming, Norma threw that idea. So we said, well, you'll be in charge. <laughs> so
So, but she did a delightful idea, and, and thank you for everybody who uh, shared and uh, participated on that. And while we're still on the recording, I want to have Jan just hopped on. She's been with us, but Jan, do you want to tell us about next week's writers chat? So we're going to go from emotional to a little bit more head, if I remember right, aren't we? Tell us about next week's writers chat. Yeah, my friend Tom Bluebaugh is going to be with us next week. Um, he's going to be trying to help writers get their business going and give help in all the different areas, um, advice. He used to be a f in finance, so he knows a lot about how to organize your business and stuff. So I come with the questions. Side of writing. Yeah, so come mm -hmm. with questions. He'll try to help you out. I think that was an idea somebody has suggested to one of us about maybe that would be a topic. So we're always looking for ideas, especially if we can have an idea of who to contact you know, on that. We're always looking for ideas. So if you ever get an idea, just let one of us know. And, and uh, when we, we get together periodically, and we kind of plan the next couple of weeks, we do look at those ideas. We really do and try to come up with them and stuff. Yvonne, do you want to say something before we go off recording? Yes, I put a suggestion in the chat. Since okay. Tina mentioned that she does the hypnotherapy and she helps people remember childhood yeah. memories. Well, what about Tina? Yeah, we love having Tina on. Tina, we'll talk to you about something on an idea, okay? That sound good? Okay, thank you. Yes, we will do that. We'll do that. Especially it'll be a, a good follow-up to this, maybe a little bit, yep on that way. Well, thank you everybody for being with us today. Thank you if you're watching this online uh, at later. I hope this has uh, stirred some memories for that. Thank you for sharing today. And again, thank you, Norma, for both the idea and the um, and the sharing on, on that way. We'll see you all next week on Writer's Chat. Bye now. <laughs>